Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. On behalf of International Bipolar Foundation, I would like to introduce our speaker, Melody Moezi. Also, Melody will not be using slides today, so the screen will remain as is throughout her talk. Melody is a writer, attorney, speaker, activist, United Nations global expert, and an award-winning author. She writes and speaks on a variety of issues, particularly those relating to Islam, Iran, and mental health. She is a blogger for the Huffington Post, Ms. and BP Magazines, and is also a featured columnist and blogger for BP Magazine. She is a graduate of Wesleyan University and the Emory University School of Law, as well as the Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. She lives in Raleigh, North Carolina with her husband, Matthew, and their cats, cats Keshmesh and Nazanin. Welcome, Melody. Thanks so much for having me. Um, okay, so should I start? Yes, go ahead. It's hard because I can't hear the audience, but uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me and also just for the International Bipolar Foundation, more importantly for all the important work that you guys do every day. I benefit from it. I know a lot of the attendees probably benefit from it as well. Um, so thank you for that. Today I wanted to read a little and speak a little, but mostly I wanted to take questions. Um, so I'm going to start off reading a little from my memoir, which is about having bipolar disorder. Um, and I will start from the beginning and read about three passages, uh, one from the beginning and one from the middle and one from the end. So uh, it'll give you a perspective of where I'm coming from um, and hopefully set the stage for a discussion. As an Iranian American Muslim in the buckle of the Bible Belt at the start of the 21st century, I've been intimately acquainted with stigma, scorn, and isolation for quite some time, long before and since Stillbrook. Stillbrook was the first psychiatric hospital I was ever admitted to uh, in Atlanta, and it's not actually called Stillbrook, it's called something else, but the lawyers made me change it, of course. Um, it's going on. But this was different. This stigma was far more suffocating, this scorn more subtle, this isolation more literal. A brutal species of shame set in, so vicious and insidious it easily could have starred in its own series on Animal Planet. Shark Week would have paled by comparison. I've never been ashamed of my background, and I've never tried to hide it. I'm proud of where I'm from, but I wasn't proud of where I'd arrived. There's no pride in being a mental patient. We have no especially loud and high-profile advocates, no Michael J. Foxes, no Christopher Reeves, no Lance Armstrongs, no pink boas or bracelets or ribbons or t-shirts. Silence and humiliation rule our playing fields, while others down performance-enhancing drugs and play on grass or astroturf. We down antipsychotics and play on quicksand. I wasn't diagnosed with bipolar disorder, also known as manic depression or manic depressive illness, until years after leaving Stillbrook, which I think is common for a lot of people. The standard is eight to 10 years before receiving a proper diagnosis uh, of bipolar disorder. That's just me talking, not reading. So I will go back to reading. Failing to recognize my propensity for mania, the folks at Stillbrook, like so many before and after them, misdiagnosed me with standard unipolar depression. I never questioned them. With bipolar disorder, it's mildly common to jump from depression to mania after a suicide attempt, and my first hospitalization was after a suicide attempt. I vaulted. My garrulousness, impulsivity, rapid speech, and elevated mood combined with my obsession with instructing the other patients in all matters imaginable should have set off some serious bipolar alarm bells, but they didn't, at least not for any of my healthcare providers. Conversely, a few of my fellow bipolar patients, lacking any formal mental health training or education, quickly caught on. When they approached me, suggesting I seem more manic than depressed, I immediately dismissed them. Telling someone who is manic that she's manic is like telling a dictator that he's a dick. Neither is going to admit it, and both are willing to torture you to prove their points. Never having been one for denailing or waterboarding, I tortured my accusers with pity. I don't blame you for trying to recruit me. It's human nature. Misery loves company and all that. But as bad as I feel for y'all, I'm still nothing like you, I told them. And I believed it. In my mind, I was a burgeoning guru, a mystic full of purpose and pristine judgment. In my mind, it had been a lifetime since I'd been on suicide watch. Actually, I'd been on suicide watch the day before. 
In my mind, I was put on that ward by God himself to guide those broken women, my future disciples, toward the land of enlightenment, the Persian Dalai Lama of Stillbrook. In reality, where time and the divine aren't nearly as foolish or forgiving, I was just another floundering psych patient. Perhaps I would have taken my comrade's diagnosis more seriously had a doctor shared their concerns, but I doubt it. I've always been exceptionally gifted in the delusional department, and the idea of having bipolar disorder doesn't sit well with my classically bipolar delusions of grandeur. Still, by that point, I'd been living with the brilliant highs and debilitating lows of the illness for well over a decade. It was my normal. At best, the marriage between mania and depression is a rocky one. At worst, it's lethal. It's just a matter of where your mind is when death approaches. So delusional and ecstatic that it tricks you into believing you can leap tall buildings in a single bound, or so depressed and hopeless that it has you begging gravity to work its morbid magic. This is what the land of manic depression looks like, though the train and mode of transport vary considerably from victim to victim. A disproportionately large number of us seek solace in words, art, and music. Others among us pursue more conventional professions with positions ranging from CEO to media mogul to world leader to drug addict to ad executive to doctor to teacher to engineer to lawyer to invalid to some amalgamation thereof. Studies show up to half of us attempt suicide at least once in our lives and 20% of us succeed. No one arrives at or departs from insanity in quite the same way. The airports are plentiful and the gates are infinite. But whatever the route, whatever the, I'm sorry, whatever the route, given a certain history and genetic inclination, going crazy is cake. And I apologize for reading quickly, but like I have bipolar disorder, so I'm going to use that as an excuse. Um, so that was from the beginning, and this is uh, I'm going to read a little from the middle and a little from the end, as I said. Beyond the this is from chapter 19 called No More Screaming. Beyond the different and potentially overlapping states of bipolar disorder, when I was diagnosed, the DSM-4 also specified several separate types of bipolar. Bipolar 1, bipolar 2, cyclothymia, and get this, bipolar NOS, or not otherwise specified. Then there's a plethora of possible add-ons, rapid cycling, ultra-rapid cycling, seasonal pattern, postpartum onset, and the list goes on. My official diagnosis, confirmed by over half a dozen second, quote, second opinions, is bipolar 1, also known as classic, quote, classic bipolar. It's considered the most severe form of the illness. Still, something about that diagnosis, even now, delights me. Just like my A+, plus, read A+, plus, not A positive, blood type. All these designations, all these words have positive connotations, and they make for such perfect and promising metaphors. Being timeless, getting the best grade, going first, what could be better? I'm hardwired to see all of these as desirable, top-notch traits. It's the result of a philosophy drilled into my head from birth, the strong and unshakable belief that by working hard and getting the best grades, anything is possible. If it means you have to be a little crazy and delusional to reach your dreams, so be it. After all, delusions aren't really delusions if you realize them. I believe in the power of words, signs, and suggestion, and one and classic sound pretty damn auspicious to me. So screw the DSM and its need to destroy perfectly good words. I prefer to believe these terms favor me, that they're signs, and that they mean what most dictionaries say they do. I know that my analysis here is about as unreasonable and unscientific as Scientology, but it makes sense to me. Still, denial is a hallmark of bipolar disorder. Despite the fact that I readily and publicly admit I have the illness, part of my experience with it includes a persistent battle between convincing myself that I have no such chronic mental illness and admitting to myself that I do. Maybe I'm okay, maybe this is all made up. Maybe it's just some way for doctors and pharmaceutical companies to take me for a ride. This is just my personality, I feel fine now. Versus, I've been sick before, I've tried to kill myself before, I've seen and heard things that weren't there, I've believed things that weren't true, I've taken my medication and gotten better, I've skipped my medication and gotten worse. I've witnessed others do, this, do so with the same results. That I feel fine now is a killer. The medications for manic depression can work wonders. I've seen it in others and I've experienced it myself, but therein lies the problem. People feel better and then con convince themselves they no longer have the disorder. Then they go off their meds. The rest of the story is so hackneyed, I won't even bother. 
but a huge part of treating bipolar requires believing that it's an illness. And what's more, admitting to yourself that you have it. For those prone to delusions in the first place, it's not really the easiest thing in the world to do. And the sane world doesn't make it any easier. If you could diagnose bipolar with a CAT scan or a blood test, I expect it would be easier to treat and much less likely to evoke so much shame and embarrassment in its victims. Still, bipolar isn't like cancer, not in the way it's diagnosed and certainly not in the way it's viewed by healthcare professionals and society as a whole. If you have cancer, you get flowers, visitors, and compassion. If you have a mental illness, you get plastic utensils, isolation, and fear. If you survive cancer, most people consider you a hero, an inspiration, and they tell you so. If you survive a mental illness, most people consider you a feeble-minded degenerate and an embarrassment, and they wouldn't dare tell you so, although they seem to love telling everyone else you might or might not know. It's more juicy gossip than medical misfortune. No one's making a killing selling bipolar survivor wristbands or schizophrenia survivor t-shirts. So now I'm going to read just a short bit from the end, and like I said, I'm hoping this will set us up for more uh, questions and discussion, because this is basically why I wrote the book, um, this short, these few paragraphs cover it. Uh, and this takes place on election night in 2008. I was, uh, on that night, I was in the hospital. I had voted early. Um, so yeah, I'll read this part. And that was, I think, my third hospitalization. And that was after a manic episode. The saddest part about being on a locked ward isn't being locked in a strange and sterile place. It's being locked out of the rest of the world. Stephen, a Vietnam vet on our floor, had asked if he could vote that day. One of the nurses laughed at him. This man had served his country and was now paying a huge price for it, and yet he wasn't even allowed to exercise his most basic civil right. CNN kept flashing this number across the screen for people to call and report if they'd had trouble voting or witnessed any voting irregularities. I wanted to call and tell them about Stephen, but then I realized how futile it would be. Imagine, hi CNN, I'm a bipolar Iranian girl on the seventh floor ward of Haven Hill Hospital in Dayton, Ohio. There's a patient who fought in Vietnam here and they won't let him vote. Oh, and he's pretty sure he's Jesus Christ. So yeah, I didn't call. Shortly thereafter, however, I did start visiting the CNN Center in Atlanta on a fairly regular basis. Not knowing anything about my psychiatric hospitalizations less than a year earlier, producers happily booked me as a sane and knowledgeable commentator on issues related to Iran and Islam. With every new interview, I felt myself gaining a little credibility, and with each new ounce of perceived clout, I imagined that the next time I ran into another Stephen, I might be able to amplify his voice just enough to get someone on the outside to listen. And that's why I wrote the book, to get someone on the outside to listen to stories like his, stories that we don't hear. And because it's not just literal, we, it's not just that we don't, don't get a vote literally. I mean, it, it, for me at the time as a lawyer, especially knowing full well that what they were doing was 100% illegal, it was so upsetting. I mean, it would be upsetting to anybody. And I mean, upsetting to the point that he was voting the wrong way as far as I was concerned. But I wanted him to have that. I mean, that was his right, you know. Um, so to sit there and witness that and to be able to do nothing about it and feel so powerless uh, was really hard for me, especially as an activist in general. Like I had worked for um, all, I've worked for LGBT rights, I've worked for Muslims after 9-11, for Iranians, I've worked for all these different groups of people who have been isolated and marginalized, and then I, I witnessed this group of people that supposedly is about 25% of the population, and yet was so quiet and so vulnerable. Um, so, I mean, basically that's why I spoke up, and um, also because of the fact that after I was diagnosed, I felt very much like the world was over for me. I was 29 years old, um, and I, you know, I was impatient, and I thought, you know, I, I can't achieve anything else in my life. And by that time, I'd already graduated law school, written my first book. Um, I graduated from, uh, I'd gotten a master's in public health. I'd done a lot, uh, and, the, and the kinds of things that were preparing me for the rest of my life, and then for someone to tell me that I had to expect less of myself, uh, was really upsetting uh, because quite honestly, now I was able to take medications and I was supposed to do better. I mean, if there was treatment for this, I hadn't been treated for 10 years. Uh, if anything, I should be doing better. And ultimately I, I was doing better. I was doing a lot better. Um, and 
to continue seeing other people tell um, people with mental illness, other healthcare providers, and people you know who um, were taken seriously in the mental health uh, world, to see them telling people to lower their expectations uh, was something I just couldn't stand, uh, which is why I started speaking out in the first place. Uh, I really believe that having a mental illness is can be valuable for sure. I mean, I've gone to hell and back because of this, um, and I wouldn't want to glamorize it at all. Uh, but at the same time, there's something amazing. There's something extraordinary about having a mind that works differently. Whether you have bipolar disorder, or schizophrenia, or autism, we have made contributions to society that I don't think so-called normal people uh, would have been able to to make. Uh, I've always thought, growing up, I mean, from the, from the first time I can remember, I have always thought that one person can change the world, which is absolutely delusional. Right. I mean, you have to be pretty delusional to believe that. But at the same time, I think the world counts on delusional people um, that if we want to change the world, that's what it requires. It requires being a little delusional. Um, and, and in that self sense, it sort of helped me. And I feel like it contributes to my creativity as well. But again, like I said, I wouldn't want to glamorize it in any way. So I have spoken. Uh, I hope that you guys have questions. Uh, I really want to hear what you guys have to say. I know there are some providers, some consumers, and hopefully other people uh, taking part, and I really can't wait to hear what you have to say, and thank you for listening to me. Great. Thank you, Melody. I have a question, first question. Sure. Um, I am a miserable bipolar. I've been sick for six years. I can't work, study go mountain climbing, which is my favorite sport. I can't seem to get into anything because it causes me stress and I get sick. Do you have suggestions for me? Yeah. Um, first off, I mean, for me, it's been a, a combination of things. And I, you know, I can't tell anybody else how to deal with their illness. And it's funny that we even call this bipolar disorder because everyone knows it's bipolar disorder. It's for everybody. It's different. Um, but like I said, I have the most extreme, ver I have bipolar one, which is supposed to be horrible, you know, and I've met people also who have schizophrenia, which is supposed to be the worst, um, who are really successful and able to accomplish a lot. Um, so, but it takes time, you know, and it takes patience. Uh, and if anything, like I said, I, I would, I would keep expecting more from yourself. You're obviously doing a lot as it is, um, and I think sometimes we can be the hardest on ourselves and not give ourselves credit uh, where it's due, because quite, I mean, there are times where my biggest accomplishments of the day are taking a shower. Um, so I, I still struggle with this illness every day, uh, and the fact is that I can't have a nine to five job. That's not something that I can do, but I have found something that works for me. Um, that's why I don't practice law anymore, you know? So I think a lot of it has to do with finding what works for you. Great, thank you. Um, we're still waiting for questions. Could you share oh, sure. more of your story? <laughs> yeah, um, really there's like 80 people on the line. You all don't have any questions. Uh, the, you know, the hardest thing about a webinar is you don't uh, you can't read the audience at all, so if you're reading something or speaking, I really count on laughter a lot, and I, I don't get to actually hear it, and I hope that you guys found something funny, um, which, yeah, so I mean, there are a lot of questions that are typical questions I get, uh, which I'm happy to go through if nobody has any questions that they're willing to ask, um, and there still aren't any, Debbie? Yes, here's a question. Okay. What are some of your trigger triggers for manic episodes? Oh, that's a great question. My main trigger for me is sleep, if I don't sleep. Um, and I'm, I'm very lucky, and this is one of the things that has helped save my life, that I'm able to take, that there are antipsychotics exist, and I, I do um, take them rarely. I take them about half a dozen times a day. Uh, a day, <laughs> that's not rarely, a year. Um, yeah, thank God I don't take them half a dozen times a day. I think that would kill me. Um, but yeah, I, I've been able to to deal with it sort of on an as-needed basis. 
Uh, so it's something I really struggle with. Uh, but if I, I, I can try and get sleep, and unless you've really experienced bad insomnia, you don't, like people are always like, oh, you do this, do that to sleep. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Um, and I really can't get any sleep. Um, and, and that can be really dangerous. And that's where, for me, the antipsychotics help in a, in a way that I've, I can take sleeping pills and they won't work. There's something um, about antipsychotic medication that does something for my brain that allows me to sleep. And I'm really grateful for it because if it weren't for those medications, I would be in the hospital nonstop, which makes you realize what a big deal it was when those medications were introduced. Great. Thank you for that. Next question. What are some ways to use bipolar disorder to be creative and productive? Instead of finding a cure, what about harnessing the condition to become successful? I'd like to be a writer and a musician. How do I do it? <laughs> I have the formula. No, I mean, there's no formula. I, I think you have it in you. Um, everybody goes about it in different ways and everybody's mind works differently. Um, but but for me, like I said, I'm not a nine to five person. I've never been able to work that way. Um, and I'm so jealous of the writers who are like, oh, I write every day for however many hours or however many words every day. And I hate, I hate them <laughs> because I can't, I really can't. I'm the kind of person, if I get down to writing, I can write for 12 hours straight, but I can not write at all for weeks. Oh, I mean, I went into a really deep depression after my book was published and didn't write for six months. Uh, so, I mean, I'm relatively successful, but I still, you know, get to the point where I'm not able to do anything for a long period of time. And there was six months. I mean, that's a long time and I'm medicated and I'm doing a lot better. Um, but still, I mean, I still struggle with it. So to try and find ways, like for me as a writer, for example, I'm much better editing when I'm depressed. Um, and writing where, when I'm more hypomanic, but mainly when I'm better, when I'm euphemic, uh, feeling normal, whatever that means. Um, but I, I would just say to trust your gut. And for me, when it comes to the arts, it's about persistence. Um, writing in particular, you can go into any bookstore and just look at <laughs> the most popular books you can find and realize like what garbage a lot of them are. <laughs> Uh, and if they can publish books, you can probably publish books, no matter how bad a writer you are. A lot of it has to do with resilience um, and just being able to get up again and again and being able to take risks. And that's something with bipolar. Uh, I found that I'm much more willing and able to do. I think if I didn't have uh, this so-called disorder, I wouldn't have left the law. I mean, that was a big decision for me to be like, I have a law degree, I've passed the bar and I'm, I've been practicing, but I'm miserable. I didn't appreciate it. I didn't enjoy it. Um, and I found something that I did enjoy. And if I didn't take that risk, I wouldn't have um, gotten where I am today. So, and I, and I think, you know, the impulsivity or risk taking behavior in that sense really helped me. Great, thank you. How can family members and friends be supportive versus not? <laughs> I always tell, I get this question a lot, and I always tell fam family members uh, that the number one thing that you should do is take care of yourself. Um, mental illness isn't contagious in the way that I've found some people in mental hospitals seem to think they are. Uh, but they, they can be very stressful. And if you don't take care of your own mental health, there's no way that you can help someone else. Uh, another thing to do that I think is really important is to set boundaries. Uh, having bipolar disorder doesn't mean that you can be an asshole. Like there's a big difference between the two. Uh, it's not an excuse for that, especially if someone knows that there's medication that can be taken, that you know they've found something that works for them. And I know that takes a while for people. Um, but if somebody goes off their medication and goes on and finds that it's working, like maybe you can do that once, but after the second time, after the third time you do that, you're hurting other people around you, you know? So I, I just, I think it's irresponsible. And I think by there, there's a lot of enabling that's similar that you, to something you would see with drug addiction and substance abuse. Um, a lot of family members think that just loving the person is enough. And unfortunately, a lot of the time you have to, you know, demonstrate tough love and set serious boundaries and say, if you're going to continue to abuse yourself um, and not take advantage of the treatments that are available to you, 
then I can't support your lifestyle anymore. And that, that to me is one of the hardest things for people to do, especially mothers. I, I talk to a lot of moms. Uh, but it's, you know, it's something you just got to learn to do. Thank you. Next question. My son was diagnosed with bipolar two. He has been unemployed for quite some time and it seems like he is unmotiv unmotivated to find a job. What can we do to encourage him to move forward? I, I want to ask her how old her son is. Um, because I mean, for one, just for normal people in this day and age, I'm 34 right now and I know that my generation, the younger generation, I feel bad for the people who are graduating right now because it is really hard uh, to find a job and it can be really um, overwhelming for anybody and frustrating and depressing whether or not you have a mental illness. Um, but I think when it comes, I mean, like I said before, at a certain point, you can't help. And the best thing you can do is take care of yourself. Um, and like I said, set boundaries. Uh, and it's it's really hard for people to accept sometimes that there may not be something that they can do um, to fix it. And sometimes pushing really hard to fix it and constantly telling your family member, are you taking your medications? Are you doing this? Like, I understand that it comes out of a place of caring and um, all of that. But sometimes that in, it, in and of itself can be even more frustrating uh, to have someone else who constantly wants to help fix you. Uh, sometimes you just need somebody to listen, uh, and having that can be really helpful in motivating somebody because they don't feel like somebody's on their back pushing them, um, which I'm sure, you know, isn't what she's trying to do uh, to put pr more pressure on him. I understand she's probably trying to just help him, uh, but sometimes the best way that you can help is just to listen. Great, thank you. Next question, would you, would you force a loved one with bipolar to get help? My husband has been, been diagnosed by different doctors and was institutionalized once, but like you mentioned, he felt better and stopped his meds in 2007. Yeah, you can't force anyone to do anything in my experience, but what you can do is in more states are adopting the, um, they have these things called psychiatric advanced directives um, so that when someone is feeling well, they're able to write up an advanced directive and give their loved one, whoever they trust, um, the power to say, yes, this person should be in the hospital, uh, you know, which is giving someone a lot of power. Uh, but at the same time, when I'm sick, if I'm manic, I want my husband making decisions for me. I don't want to be making decisions for myself. I want my family to be in charge of that because I will do what is not in my best interest. Um, and I know a lot of families struggle with legal issues because sometimes the only way to get someone help is to say, oh, this person is my son or daughter is threatening to kill him or herself, even if he or she isn't, or threatening to hurt somebody else, even if he or she isn't, uh, you know, which is really difficult. Uh, but at the same time, I can understand where the balance needs to be with the law in terms of protecting the civil liberties of people with mental illness because a lot of times they do end up in hospitals when they shouldn't be and not all families are concerned enough to go onto an international bipolar foundation webinar uh, and to be that informed you know just to be that interested in helping their loved ones so in an, i mean that says something uh, but in terms of forcing someone to get help if they're an adult you can't and even if they're a child i have found you technically you can if someone's a minor under the age of 18 uh, and you're their parent, uh, but you got to be really careful there because forcing someone to into treatment can also be really dangerous. You you have to recognize that going into um, a psychiatric hospital, especially inpatient, creates trauma. It's a trauma that someone will have to deal with later. And I've had that experience. I've been in three separate inpatient psychiatric hospitals. And I am currently in the process of trying to deal with the trauma that was the result of my hospitalization, right? Like there's some irony there, obviously. Um, but yeah, and for me, another thing that's been really helpful, and I'm not pressuring anyone on anything, is just faith in general. Um, and I know that it's been helpful for my family as well. Great, thank you. 
How do you feel about the term bipolar being so loosely used in mainstream society? It is, a, <laughs> it is as if someone is in a mood, they are automatically bipolar. Kids use the term bipolar and crazy nowadays. <clears throat> um, um, yeah, you know, I, that's another question I get a lot. And I was one of those people before I was diagnosed that used the word bipolar as a pejorative. I, I mean, I'm sure that I did. I can't remember a specific instance, but I'm loose with words, so I probably did. Uh, likewise, with crazy in particular, I've chosen to own it as a word, um, which some people take offense to, and I, I understand. But I don't think it's something that we're going to take out of our vernacular, and it's not something that I've been able to take out. I sit all the time, I find myself saying, oh, my God, that's so crazy. <laughs> so... Um, and I mean something completely different. And I think you can tell when someone is has vicious intent behind what they're saying. Um, so for me, it's helped me a lot just to not take too much offense to it. And But at the same time, with bipolar in particular, and I hear it used a lot with schizophrenic, um, and people don't understand what these illnesses are, and they throw these words around. And it has a lot to do with the fact that also we don't understand what these illnesses are. We don't know exactly what the cause is. We don't know exactly why the medications that work to treat them actually work to treat them. Um, and I think, I mean, that's a place where research is so important. But, uh, and I think research and advancements in that will help change the vocabulary. But at the same time, also, I think art is another really powerful way to change that vocabulary, or at least if it's going to be there, uh, give people a better sense of what it actually means. And for me, I feel like I'm able to say, <laughs> say crazy uh, in a way that somebody who doesn't have a mental illness really probably shouldn't, if that makes sense. Thank you. Next question. I would like to have a child in a year or so, but the, the thought of taking psychotropics while pregnant terrifies me due to the risk for morbidity to the unborn child. Have you thought about this as a woman? Yeah, I'm, you know, I've never really liked children in general. They, they haven't appealed to me. My sister has three of them. I think they're great for other people. They've just, and I'm lucky in that sense because I've never wanted them and it has nothing to do. And people ask me all the time, is it because you have bipolar? It has nothing to do with that. I would have no problem having a child um, with bipolar. I would be very concerned about pregnancy, especially postpartum depression or possibly postpartum psychosis. Um, my, my, one of my roommates at one of the hospitals where I was admitted, she had just had a baby and experienced with postpartum psychosis. Uh, and it, I mean, just watching what she had to go through, it was really difficult uh, just for me to watch it, let alone, you know, for her to experience it. Uh, but, you know, it's not something that you would not want to do necessarily. It's just a matter of whether or not to be taking the medications. And that's something you have to consult with your doctor about. And I'm sure if you're interested in getting pregnant and you have bipolar, you've already done that. And you've already looked into uh, studies and things like that. And unfortunately, they aren't there. A lot of uh, things we just don't know about just like, as with, you know, childhood bipolar, there, there are ethical issues about studying pregnant women or children. Um, so, but in terms of whether or not to take the medication, I've, I've known people who have taken the medication during pregnancy and I've known people who haven't. Uh, and I've seen some who haven't do really well and have no trouble. And I've seen some who have taken it, um, have a lot of trouble. So, I mean, there's no telling. Everybody's body is different, but I would be very careful and cautious as it seems like you already are. Great. Thank you. Do you find throughout the course of your illness that you have been over-medicated? And if so, how did you advocate for yourself? Oh, thank you, whoever asked that question. <laughs> I think it's a huge problem over-medicating people with bipolar and with schizophrenia. Um, just because we don't know how these illnesses really work, sometimes psychiatrists, their response is just to throw medication at it, um, which is scary, and especially if you can't advocate for yourself and you're in a vulnerable position. Uh, I was definitely over-medicated uh, during certain periods of time, and it was hard for me to really advocate for myself 
I grew up in a family of doctors. I had a lot of respect for doctors. If somebody's wearing a white coat, I immediately trust them. But honestly, if you have this illness, if you're educating yourself on it, that it's entirely possible, even not being a physician, that you know more about it uh, than somebody who happens to have studied it in school. And, you know, I mean, I value education a lot, but you can educate yourself. Um, and I think that's really important when it comes to being over-medicated. I so I've, I don't, I've heard the statistics, maybe someone can correct me, but I think it's something like five medications the average person is on uh, who has bipolar. And for me, I, I happen to be on one medication for bipolar, actually two medications. Um, and Zyprexa, the, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say the names of drugs, the antipsychotic that I take, I take, like I said, very rarely. But I've had people suggest that I take it all the time. And unfortunately, another thing that I think doctors do a lot without paying attention, psychiatrists will prescribe a medication that will cause extreme weight gain, will cause possibly the problem that it's trying to treat, uh, will, will cause all these different, will cause cognitive difficulties and fogginess. Like obviously the number one reason you stop taking a medication is because the side effects are overwhelming. Uh, and we need to advocate for ourselves and remind psychiatrists in particular that the mind and body are attached and our bodies are valuable and they affect our minds. So if you're going to damage our bodies in your effort to um, treat the mind as if those are two separate things, uh, you may want to reconsider. But I think advocating for yourself is a huge part of that and educating yourself as well. Great, thank you. Um, next question, what are the differences between bipolar one and two and how can you tell or does it require professional diagnosis? Uh, it definitely requires a professional diagnosis, but I wouldn't trust that. I would trust like half a dozen professional diagnoses. Uh, the difference is, and I said it, that bipolar one is the most extreme form of the illness. That's not to say that by people who deal with bipolar two don't struggle just as much. Uh, it's just a different kind of struggle. With bipolar one, that means that somebody has ex experienced at least one acute manic episode in the past. And that manic episode, that, that's why I was diagnosed. I've only had one acute manic and psychotic episode where I experienced hallucinations and severe delusions uh, and things like that. Whereas with bipolar two, people experience only hypomania, which is only, it's, it's still going to be pretty bad, but which is a mild for, milder form of mania that uh, doesn't lead to psychosis. Uh, but, you know, it, it's hard to distinguish sometimes, and some of these labels really concern me because, like I said, everybody is different, um, and labeling it, while it can be really helpful uh, in realizing that you're not alone, uh, that can also be somewhat damaging because you close your mind. For example, for 10 years, I thought I had unipolar depression. So I closed my mind to the, you know, the chance that I might have something else, which at the time was probably bipolar two, meaning that I should have been on a mood stabilizer and wasn't. And the fact that I wasn't and occasionally took anti, was prescribed antidepressants, which actually make bipolar worse. Uh, if you don't, you're not taking a mood stabilizer with it generally, uh, you know, that could very well have led to me having gone to the place where now I have bipolar one. It was a progression. Thank you. Next question. Um, do you have psychotic episodes? I have an adult mm -hmm. child who frequently becomes delusional when changing meds for bipolar one with psychosis. Yeah, I do. I, and that's, Part I've I've had one full blown psychotic episode, and I, I again like with the labels I still have hallucinations, um, delusions not so much because I take the medication early enough on uh, that the delusions generally don't set in. But if I don't take the medication within 24 hours of my first experiencing a hallucination, I will start believing that the hallucinations are real. Whereas in the first 24 hours, generally, I mean, you can't exact numbers, but generally within the first day, I know that what's happening to me isn't real. But after that first day, it can become confusing and reality uh, starts slipping away. Uh, and the, unfortunately, some of the medications used to treat 
psychosis can cause psychosis. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really hard. Uh, although the antipsychotic medications I've found in general, that it, and I hate to say easy, but it's much easier to treat mania and psychosis, in my experience, than it is to treat bipolar depression. Uh, because of the risk of giving an antidepressant to someone with bipolar and the risk of them jumping into mania. Um, and I've had a lot more trouble with that. And if there's a way to hold the psychosis back by taking medications as needed on a PRN basis, which is what I've done, obviously I'm not recommending anything, but uh, that has been really helpful for me. And like I said, someone has, doctors have told me before, you should take these antipsychotic every day. Uh, and I would be a zombie if I took that medication every day. But I do take it within that first 24 hours, like I said, a half a dozen times a year, um, roughly. So, and, and that to me has been really helpful in warding off psychotic episodes if I can catch mania early enough on. I don't experience, I haven't experienced psychotic depression before. Thank you. I've just read an article that said it is not a chemical imbalance that causes bipolar, that that is a myth. The meds oh. seem to work, but that doesn't prove it's a chemical imbalance. What do you think? Um, well, I mean, whether or not it's a chemical imbalance, like I said before, we don't know. We don't know what this is, but uh, what the exact cause of it is, although there have been studies to show that the brain is structurally different, um, that there is, there is a distinction in chemistry between somebody who has bipolar and someone who doesn't. Um, but at the same time, when it's so difficult to diagnose and it's not immediately clear what it is, uh, that's, that's a question. But I, I definitely think that it has something to do with chemistry, for sure. Uh, but if you take, for example, in genetics, I mean, if you take identical twins, if one has bipolar, the chance of the other one having it is about 70%. The chance in the general population is anywhere from two to six percent. So obviously there's a huge genetic component. Uh, whether that's chemistry, whatever that is, that's something internal and that doesn't have to do with your environment. But there is that 30 percent. Uh, so it obviously has something to do with environment in general as well. Uh, but the standard opinion tends to be that people are born with a genetic predisposition toward bipolar and then it may happen that they present with the illness or it may happen that they don't. Sometimes it's, it can result from trauma, but once the general consensus is once you've been diagnosed, you can't go backwards, uh, which is why catching it early on is really important. Great, thank you. My psychiatrist has recommended that I remain on a mood stabilizer for the rest of my life. This concerns me as I've experienced adverse rea reactions from various psychotropics. Are you familiar with any research on alternative treatments for BP that I do not that do not include um, psychotropics? I'm familiar with research. I don't, I don't trust it. So I mean, some of it, there, especially with respect to the connection between the gut and the brain, there's been a lot of research. Um, in terms of there being something different in your gut. There's been research in terms of possibly toxoplasmosis contributing to it. Um, so there, and there are people, I have met one person in my life who has um, had bipolar one and is doing well, has done well for over 10 years without medication. I've met a lot of people with bipolar, a lot more who have, started their medication, done well on it, gone off and, and not done well. But I, I totally see where you're coming from because I'm in the same position. And recently, uh, very recently, I, I'm starting to see a new psychiatrist who is actually in, an amazing psychiatrist actually, and he uh, has suggested for the first time in my life, because I'm, I'm having issues cognitively remembering words and things like that, and I've been on the same medication for over five years, uh, and he, he said, you know, if you're having cognitive issues, maybe we want to think about going down on the medication, which is the first time in my life anybody has said that who, who's a psychiatrist. Uh, but the truth is, yeah, it, it may make a difference uh, going lower on the medication. It may help. 
Uh, and I, I honestly, I'd never thought of that. I thought if you want to fix something, you always go higher on the medication. And that's generally what most uh, people in the mental health field seem to think, um, at least on the clinical side. Uh, but the idea of being on a mood stabilizer for the rest of your life, I know it sucks. It really does. But I, I may very well, I probably will have to do that. Um, but that, and I will do this one experiment, when I, which I'm doing right now, uh, oddly enough, where I am trying to lower my dose and see if I'm able to do well without it. But I'm going very slowly under um, the supervision of a psychiatrist who I see once a week. I'm really cautious about it. We've gotten to the point where I went down and then went back up. Um, so it's possible I can be on a lower dosage. I doubt I'll be able to go off it entirely. Uh, and that's something I just need to accept, which I know is hard. Thank you. I was diagnosed bipolar a few years ago. I am doing well, and I sometimes wonder if the diagnosis is, in, or is correct. In your experience, do people get misdiagnosed very often? Yeah, they do. Um, I've heard people get misdiagnosed with bipolar when they have unipolar depression. People get misdiagnosed with unipolar like I did. Uh, when somebody has bipolar, for women, it's quite common to be misdiagnosed with unipolar depression. Uh, and for men, it's more common to be misdiagnosed with schizophrenia. So getting a proper diagnosis is really, really important. Uh, so when I talk about labels, getting in the way sometimes, it's still important to have at least like a relatively proper diagnosis to know whether or not you can take antidepressants without a mood stabilizer or whether or not you need antipsychotics daily. Um, I think it's totally understandable uh, under the supervision of a doctor to try it once uh, if you know you've been well for a while to see if you can go off of your medications under the supervision of a psychiatrist. Like I said, most people probably can't, uh, including myself, but I think it's worth testing, you know, because your diagnosis may not be accurate and the only way you may be able to figure that out is if you alter the medications. Um, so it's acceptable, like I think it's totally fine to do, but after that first try, if it doesn't work, then you know it doesn't work. And in that, in that case, that's where you have to be responsible. Uh, and when I was talking, uh, answering the question, to that mother who was talking about her son. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to be responsible after you realize you need or don't need the medication. You know what I mean? Which you're not gonna say, yeah, I know what you mean, because you, can, you can't respond. Great, thank you. There is research pointing to the brain's regenerative abilities. What is your feeling about improving the symptoms of mental illness, bipolar, for the long term? Yeah, you know, that's really exciting. The whole idea of neuroplasticity, that you can change the structure of your brain, not just that we can create new neurons, but like we can literally change the structure. And, you know, the conclusion from that is, oh, maybe you can cure it. Maybe there is something that you can do. Um, I think if that were the case, we would have figured it out a while ago. But uh, that's not to say, you know, there there is that possibility. And I think as we learn more, um, about how the brain works and, and you know that's a recent discovery that you can change the actual structure of your brain by changing what you do um, and how you react you you have people who for example are blind uh, and then you notice they've noticed like in the bl brains of people who are blind when they're doing activities that involve touching and feeling things their visual cortex lights up uh, which isn't supposed to happen right um, so, I mean, the brain is pretty amazing in terms of how it can recover and what it can accomplish. Uh, and medication isn't the only thing that can help. You know, a lot of other things can help. Some, whoever was asking about alternative treatments, and I'm not saying like this alone without medication would necessarily work, uh, but definitely diet, exercise, sleep have a lot to do with the treatment of bipolar. I had someone once tell me that with any chronic illness, whether it's bipolar MS or any sort of chronic illness, um, what you, the, the treatment, you know, the main treatment aside from medication is that you need to do what everybody else is supposed to do, but doesn't. You need to exercise and do all the, the really important stuff that, you know, everyone is supposed to do. And saying that, I should also say that you're not going to be perfect. 
Uh, I've had a lot, of, I've struggled a lot with exercise. I'm not good at it at all, and I've been trying for the longest time, but I still do fairly well. I eat okay. I don't eat fantastically well. My, you know, my lifestyle is okay. Uh, I sleep is really important, as I mentioned. So I'm really good about sleep, but diet and exercise aren't the best. And I've still been able, you know, I'm not too hard on myself about it, but I've still been able to be relatively do relatively well. But again, as I mentioned, I'm 34 years old. As I get older, it's going to be tougher, and I'm going to have to get better at it. The diet and exercise part. Great, thank you. Are you familiar with HR 3717, introduced by Congressman Tim Murphy, Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act? And have you experienced anosognosia? <laughs> um, Ooh, that's a big word. Yeah, anosognosia. Anosognosia is uh, basically lack of insight. Uh, it happens... Uh, with mental illness, it also happens with other illnesses. Just not having insight into the fact that you're, you have a mental illness or that you're in the midst of an episode. Uh, as opposed to, uh, with respect to HR 3713, I'm not aware of it. And I, you guys in front of you have my Twitter uh, handle and my Facebook address, whatever it is. Uh, so you can, if you, whoever asked this question, if you could reach out to me on Facebook or Twitter, uh, and send me some information. I would love to know more about it. Uh, with respect to anosognosia, yes, I've experienced it. And I, I write in the book about how the number one sign that you're crazy is you think that you're not and you think everyone else is. Uh, with mania for me, it was definitely like that. And with depression, I, I don't experience it. But with mania, I, I experienced anosognosia real bad. And in the book, at one point, I write about I could be the poster child for anosognosia, and I use the word, so I appreciate you using that word and throwing it out there. Great, thank you. Um, I suffer from PMDD in addition to bipolar one and have been researching with my gynecologist, psychiatrist docs about taking hormones. What are your thoughts on that? I take only one medication for BP1 daily. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, I, I don't have that issue, but I do have, um, I have been on birth control for going on 15 years, um, the pill for going on 15 years, and it's actually helped my mood. For some people, it does the absolute opposite. Um, and dealing with PMDD, I know, is, can be really difficult. My dad is an OBGYN, uh, so I'm very familiar with it, but uh, not personally. If you're only taking one medication for BP1, it, it may be possible that you can do well uh, taking hormonal medications, but it may be that you can't. You know, basically you have to try it. Uh, the other thing is people with bipolar disorder are far more likely, especially women, to suffer from migraines. I don't know if you have migraine, uh, but if you do, that's another thing to consider if you're going on any sort of hormonal contraception or, or hormone replacement therapy. Um, definitely something to consider as well. But obviously I would consult with your doctor and you seem to be doing the right things if you are consulting with your doctors together. And it's important that they communicate, which is often very difficult to do, but you have to fight for it. They should be communicating, the psychiatrist and the OBGYN. Great, thank you. What can we learn about the relationships between bipolar condition and religion, philosophy, et cetera? Many important historical figures have accomplished much by harnessing bipolar. A related question is whether to regard bipolar as a disorder or a condition. Your thoughts? Um, I'll go with the last one first. I think it's probably better to call it a condition because disorder has all these weird connotations. Um, that, and it's not just a disorder. For At certain periods, yeah, it's disordered living, having it, but it, at other times it is just a condition that could be helpful uh, with, you know, if you're dealing with it well and you're able to harness it. But with respect to religion, I was a philosophy major, so I really appreciate this question. And my first book was about religion as well, so these are things that really 
interest me, especially the mystical experience. I was, uh, I've had one mystical experience in my life and it was pretty amazing. Um, and I, after I was diagnosed with bipolar, I sort of threw that away. Um, and I would actually say now that I have two because there were periods with mania that I did experience something that was really amazing and mystical and worth at least paying attention to. Uh, and I think in medicine, a lot of times with mania and for years, I thought that's all throwaway. Any sort of what I thought was spiritual, mystical, whatever, that was just part of the illness. And I put it in a box and I, I thought it was throwaway. But uh, it took me a while to realize that there was value to the insights that um, I came upon while I was in an acute manic episode and also before that uh, when, I, when I wasn't uh, acutely manic, but I definitely was hypomanic. Uh, but I think there's a lot of connection there between religion, philosophy, and mental health, I mean, the seat of the soul, according to most philosophers, will tell you that the seat of the soul is in the mind. Um, so if philosophy is the study of the soul, and there, there's a lot to be said there, uh, and obviously the same with uh, spirituality or religion or whatever you want to call it. So yeah, I, I hope there's more research into that. And also, whoever asked that question, if you know of any, if you could send it to me as well, I would appreciate it. Great, thank you. Next question. My daughter is doing pretty well with her bipolar diagnosis, but she never wants to talk about it. She is looking mm -hmm. for a job and has not been successful. I think she's still in denial, and I would like to see her see a therapist, but again, she will not even talk about her diagnosis. It seems that there is shame attached with it. That was the end of the question, but I think she's asking how she can help her, obviously, yeah. get to the therapist. Yeah, denial, denial is a huge problem. I, I don't know how old your daughter is, but uh, sometimes it's just a matter of maturity. In a lot of ways, I think I was sort of lucky that I was diagnosed so late because I was in a place in my life that I, I, I feel like I was mature enough at 29 to sort of cope with it and accept it in a way that I probably couldn't have when I was, I definitely couldn't have when I was 20. Um, so in denial in general, I mean, that's a huge problem for everyone. And that's a huge problem for me. I'm sitting and talking to you with my name and face attached to the word bipolar. And I speak about this all the time. And I still sort of want to believe I don't have it. You know, that's a part of the illness. Uh, and I think accepting that that's part of the illness is a really big part of dealing with it and also getting over that shame. Uh, and if in terms of what to do to, to get her to see a therapist, again, you can't force anyone to do anything, but you can help her get rid of that shame um, by, you know, if she's not willing to talk about it and she's not going to talk about it. And I, I mean, I've been in that position <laughs> and people did send me information at, at, during that time. People would send me information and say, oh, look at this, look at this article or um, look, such and such apparently had bipolar. And it gave me actually a lot of hope looking and seeing uh, all the people both historically who people, K. Redfield Jameson wrote a book about this, um, think were, I guess, after death, they were uh, diagnosed by some psychiatrists and uh, with bipolar. And I, I actually found, and obviously there are people who are living who are really creative and functional. Uh, although it is depressing if you look at her book, all the people who kill themselves, especially poets and composers, uh, the suicide rates were really high, but those are also historical figures before the kinds of medications that are available now uh, were available. So I, I, I take a little hope in that. But in terms of how to get her to see a therapist, you really can't uh, force her. But another thing is if you need help with it, uh, dealing with her, maybe if you saw a therapist, if you don't already, uh, that might open the door for her. And I mean, regardless, you're not going to do that just to open the door for her, but it may help you. I've found that it can. Uh, whether or not you're dealing with mental illness, therapy can be really enlightening. Great. Thank you, Melody. That seems to be all the questions today, and we're right at 10 o'clock. So I want to, again, um, 
thank you and let you know how much we appreciate you sharing your story and answering everyone's questions. Thank you, Debbie. I really appreciate it. And like I said, feel free to reach out to me uh, through Twitter and Facebook. I would love to hear if you guys have anything to teach me. I've learned a lot from other people and I'm totally open to it. So please reach out. Great. Thank you everyone for joining us.